Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The next important uh, aspect in the neural net part is uh, the activation function. You remember we spoke about the activation function even in the perceptron. Uh, there are, we only spoke about one you know, simple activation function there, right? It is a hard threshold part. So, now we are going to be talking about uh, sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, rectified uh, linear unit and also a leaky linear, uh, rectified linear unit and finally, a softmax. So, all are useful. Uh, you would see in many cases sigmoid, and softmax. Softmax is usually used at the end of the uh, network layer or at the output layer. Sigmoid, tan or other hyperbolic tangent relu are all used in the hidden layer portions. Okay. Why do we need a, a different sets of activation functions? So, we will talk about that now. Okay. Uh, I do not need to explain this uh, in detail. A hot threshold is something where if a value is beyond a point, it is 1, otherwise it is equal to 0, right. So, this is a hot threshold that we used in the perceptron. So, we will now get into the uh, very interesting activation function called sigmoid. Sigmoid is a nonlinear function, okay. So, it converts uh, a set of values that you provide. and squashes it into the sigmoidal function as I had shown here in the graph. Okay. So, it actually squashes the values in the range of 0 to 1. So, you have 0 here and then here. So, any value that you provide to this in, uh, activation function, it will always be limited to this range 0 to 1. And then we have a, a tail, there are this region is called a tail region. Okay. So, in this uh, particular region, if your value that you are computing in the H1 in the hidden layer, if you are getting it here, they will be saturated to either 0 or if the values are here, it will equal to 1. So, every time when you uh, see that you are very quickly getting into this space, uh, you will notice that you are getting into the trouble of learning. Okay. Here in this case, there is there will be no learning uh, since uh, the values here every time when you start computing the value would always be equal to 0, right? like we had seen in the bias part in the XR computation, right. So, I told you that we are going to be removing that by it because the weight is 0. The, when the weight values are 0, there is going to be no learning that you will get or if you have it at this point, in, at this point as well, there will be no learning. So, we ideally want to keep all the values in this region. Maybe let me use a different color here in this region. Uh, the sigmoid outputs are not 0 centered. So, as we had seen here, 0 is here and then 1 is at this point. It is desirable or rather it is undesirable to have all the values squashed near the tails where the gradient is 0. So, the reason why the gradient should not be equal to 0 is if we, you remember we are calculation of uh, weight is like this. This is the iteration number uh, 
Okay. So, this is our gradient part. Right. So, every time when we want to adjust the weights, uh, there has to be some value associated with this. If this is equal to 0, that means there is going to be no more learning or if the system has already learnt it. And if you very quickly reach this stage of delta w equal to 0, that means there is something wrong with your uh, input or something wrong with your network design, something wrong with your weight initialization and so on. Okay. So, you may want to uh, check your architecture and the input parameter that you are giving, so that uh, the network does not get into the stage of delta w equal to 0 in the second iteration or third iteration itself. Okay. So, we need to have some uh, difference between the previous iteration and this iteration, so that this value is not equal to 0. That means, we want to have some gradient managed or maintained. When you have a gradient uh, which is in this space, then we are doing good. And if your gradient, uh, if you are already into this space, the gradient would be equal to 0, there will be no learning in the network. right? The learning or the model preparation is all about uh, finding the right values of the weights, is not it. So, in order for us to get a very stable uh, weight matrix. So, you need to have a, a good activation function that is differentiable. Okay. Note the word differentiable. If the act activation function is not differentiable, then it is not possible for you to do the learning for the neural network. That is why sigmoid is chosen. Okay. So, there are different uh, varieties you will get and ultimately we do not want to have a very long tail like this, because the values would very quickly saturate to 0 or 1. Okay. This is one uh, activation function. Then second one is uh, a hyperbolic tangent. So, this uh, is again very similar to the sigmoid, but only different that you notice here is the range is between minus 1 to plus 1. So, you will see this in many uh, recurrent neural network models. So, in the <coughs> hidden layer uh, computation, uh, you will notice TANS will play a great role in terms of uh, translating or the squashing the values between minus 1 and plus 1. So, again uh, you have a function which is differentiable. Okay. And you have one more uh, activation function called rectified uh, linear unit. So, again it is similar to a sigmoid or the hyperbolic tangent, only a change would be you have only a tail here and you do not have anything. You can see that it is continuously differentiable in this fashion. So, you always have some value associated. Again, uh, it makes sure that there is no 0, so that uh, most of the values would always be uh, kept in this region. So, that when you do the error correction mechanism, you have some delta value available for you, so that the system learns. Okay. So, it uh, produces an efficient uh, propagation of the gradient and also it is computationally efficient, so you do not need uh, to compute that, you know, if you use the sigmoidal function, the sigmoidal function, right? And this is pretty simple. You just uh, very similar to your max value zero of x. So it just tries to find out which one is the maximum, keeps that value. Okay. So here it is always. So, it is very easy to implement as well. Okay. And then it is scale invariant, does not matter how many ever times you multiply the value with the scale factor, it does not change. The only uh, difference between those uh, sigmoidal and hyperbolic tangent is this is not a bounded function. 
So, the values can be anything depends on what value of x you get okay? and it is also not 0 centered like sigmoidal. Okay. So, I have given a simple uh, implementation of all of this and uh, uh, like any other uh, application that I have showing as a demo, this also is available as part of the uh, GitHub. So, we can take a look at this. This is a very simple uh, implementation. Uh, normal if you include this as part of the uh, class, a uh, network class, you know, you probably would not have this, you just input uh, sigmoid x. Okay. If it is part of the class, maybe a python class, you will have this as x. And then still, uh, since you are going to be using derivatives of the sigmoid okay, uh, in the next uh, uh, stage of network building, we will also have another variable uh, instead of this, sorry about that, uh, sigmoid false. So, that when you pass the value either you want to find the sigmoid or you want to find the derivative of this. Okay. So, in one simple function you can achieve both. Okay. So, uh, use uh, NumPy, you know it is there is a big debate going on in the Reddit in terms of either it is NumPy or NumPy or something else. right? So, I will be using NumPy or NumPy whichever uh, comes to at that point in time. Okay. Uh, we have TANH, it is very simple, uh, TANH is uh, Okay, and this is what is implemented. And then ReLU, I use a maximum, I am just using a very simple thing which is between 0 and the value, I'm not using the leaky ReLU that I had shown earlier. And then uh, the next one is softmax, we will talk about that and then come to this one. So, in this case, you want to find uh, uh, the sigmoid of this using this function, you need to provide the input the weight vector and the bias and it will automatically give you the uh, sigmoidal value for that. Okay. All right. So, we are going to be having more number of uh, classes that you want to figure out. As I mentioned earlier in, uh, in the previous lectures, if you have collected a lot of documents related to the computer science topic, you know you would like to have a folder called operating system, you want to have a compiler design for uh, one folder and then you want to have discrete mathematics and so on and so forth. right? So, there are going to be multiple classes that you will find uh, in the real uh, situation. So, we should be able to accommodate the multiple classes in the case of a neural net as well. So, how do I accommodate that? So, most of the activation that function that we are talking about either uh, squashes the value between 0 and 1 or minus 1 and plus 1. So, it is going to be very difficult for me to use a multi class using that, right. So, if you are having separate several values, I cannot say that use the value for class 1, this for class 2, uh, 3 and uh, so on, right. So, instead we need to have a, a separate uh, decision function that allows you to create uh, multiple classes in itself. So, let us talk about that. Uh, we need this for document classification. Uh, even in the sentiment analysis, you know, especially in the movie reviews, you want to find out whether the sentiments are positive sentiment, negative sentiments, neutral or it is not related to movie. For example, you have uh, received a lot of documents out of which one document is an outlier, meaning that the document does not belong to any one of the movie reviews, it is something else. Okay. Again, uh, you want to find out whether the word that you are talking about is uh, positive, negative or something else. Okay. Let us put it as R. So, in those cases, it is necessary to have 
a decision function that allows us to uh, predict more number of classes and not just two, right. As I mentioned, the extension of the case function is very hard to manage. So, we need to definitely have one uh, function that allows us to uh, predict more classes. That is where softmax comes into picture. Okay. So, it has to take a set of uh, vectors of size n and then finally, creates a k class. Say for example, uh, I have a network that takes input parameters such as these and this is my input layer and I have a hidden layer and they are interconnected and then I have output layer again they are interconnected in this fashion and it should output uh, k classes. Okay. Let us assume that I have more of these. So, k classes. So, the uh, values should be able to tell me whether uh, the one that I have recently computed using the network belongs to one of the k classes or not. So, that is the idea of uh, having a, a k classifier in the neural net model. Okay. So, let me give you one example. Uh, let us assume that we have uh, captured all the uh, words okay, uh, as a dictionary and then we have created the one hot uh, vectors for all the words. Uh, okay. so you know what one hot vector right for each word. Supposing if you have about uh, 100 words that we are going to be using for the training, uh, we will have a vector containing 100 elements and the index of that element would point to the word that we are talking about. right? So, I am going to be inputting this 100 elements uh, one hot vector into this and then at the end uh, in the output layer, I want to be able to predict whether it is one of those 100 words. It is not about positive or negative, especially in the case of word embedding, this is what we are going to be uh, doing. Okay, so, I am going to be inputting one word using the one hot vector and then the weights are initialized in some fashion and I have more than um, uh, one hidden layer uh, rather hidden units. Let us assume that is about uh, 100 okay. and then I have k classes. Let us assume that there are 100 uh, uh, classes that we are going to be looking at meaning each word will be considered as one class. Okay. So, when the output is generated, it is not going to be uh, in an ideal situation like one hot vector right? in this way. So, it will have some values. All the elements or all the neurons will have some values. Let us say that they are ranging from uh, 0, 1, 0, and so on. And they are not bounded by some way. So, what we want to do is we want to see whether the output value, since we are expecting an output very similar to this, uh, values except for this particular index, let us assume that this is the uh, 35th uh, element, 35th element should have some value, rest of them uh, should have 0 values. But ideally, since we are doing the computation in the uh, real space, it is not going to have 0 or 1 you know, in the binary form, that is going to have some value. What I want uh, to this? Okay. So, I want to have a distribution of values between 0 and 1. And then the 35th element I want that to have a higher value. 
you know when the network is trained very well. So, when the network is not trained any value uh, in the output uh, element could have a higher value correct. So, for me to distinguish which one should have uh, the right value I need to have a proper distribution of values in this case. So, what we do is we do a, a softmax computation where the values of the output would be translated into a probability distribution and every element will have a probability value and uh, the sum of all the values if we take it you know after we uh, translate this into softmax if you push it through softmax we will have again a different set of real values and if you sum all these values it will be equal to 1 that we know right in the probability distribution part. So, we are distributing the probability mass of 1 to all the elements 100 elements in this uh, vector space and then only one of that would be uh, should be having a higher value rest should be having a very low value. So, that we can propagate the error back. So, in order for us to do this we use the softmax and softmax picks up the values between 0 and 1 every element will have some probability and we have the entire thing as a probability distribution. And when the 35th element is not equal to 1, but let us assume that 23rd element is, e is uh, closer to 1 that has the higher value we know that there is a error that is not the uh, word that I am expecting. I am expecting a word where the 35th element should have a higher value. So, the now we know that there is an error and then do the back propagation. So, for you to do that operation we require a uh, softmax. We will I will talk about this in detail later though, but uh, I thought uh, this is essential for you to understand why we are bringing in the uh, softmax. Okay. Um, so, this actually normalizes the net output and then the classes are really well separated. So, when you do that uh, you know after a good amount of training you will see that the 35th element is gaining more and more value in the uh, probability distribution. Okay. A simple implementation would be uh, as follows. So, you have the input and the output and the bias and uh, we need to find the as softmax for w when you input w x and b it should in it should give you the distribution. And if you do that you will see in this case uh, we are feeding the uh, w as r s and then we have some x values and then the y values are computed using w x uh, the dot product of w x and uh, uh, w and x and then it is uh, summed with the bias. Uh, we are assuming that the b is uh, also having some weight values that I am not showing here. When you run the soft mass function what you get is this. Okay, so, it is a distribution or uh, the values are distributed and you can see that the middle value has a higher uh, probability. Uh, so, we saw uh, the set of activation functions and now we will also talk about what is a loss function and a cost function. In many cases uh, you would notice that the loss and cost are uh, interchangeably used, but I would like to uh, separate this out a little bit. Okay. The loss function is computed based on the mean square error. You know what is the uh, output that you are computing and what is the target. Okay. So, here this you know now very well right. Uh, so, we have the predicted value computed using this equation 2 and w naught is your bias and x is the input vector and w is the weight vector and if y is the target that we are looking at the loss is computed using the mean square uh, equation as follows. Okay, so the idea is to minimize this loss correct. 
So, when it becomes negligible, I, we can say that we can stop, we can, we can tell this system that stop the iteration. So, okay. The cost function is a little different. Uh, if you look at the uh, difference here, let us talk about the loss function is a prediction and the uh, is a function of uh, prediction and target values, right. Uh, in the cost function, what we do is we just uh, call this as the function of model parameters and bias. This theta represents your w and the bias. This is the parameter that uh, these are the parameters we are uh, trying to estimate, right. Uh, in the model. So, this is going to represent the uh, parameters that are going to be estimating. So, it is usually represented as uh, j theta. Okay. It is very similar to what we saw earlier, but in this case this will represent uh, only the, the computation is very similar to what we have done in the loss function, okay. uh, but there is a slight uh, change in the representation here. And another one, uh, I think I spoke about this a little bit earlier, we would be using gradient descent in order to find the local minima. I will be talking about uh, the local minima most of the time in many cases, you know, the ideally uh, this is what we expect and then our minimization problem comes down in the negative slope and then finally reaches the end point here. the end point, okay. But in the so you may also get something like this or you may find the error function going like this. In most cases you know when you follow the gradient descent ideally I want this to come down the slope and then finally, when it reaches the minimum, uh, there will be no more change. That is when you know the value of the gradient will become very small or it will be equal to 0. We say that okay, I reached the uh, end of my uh, weight computation. Okay. So, that means uh, I can stop my iteration. We do not get into that uh, many times we will come here and then get to this point and think that this is my minima, but my global minima is somewhere here. Uh, since the algorithm will start finding the increase in the error value after some point, you will think that okay, it is not doing good. Let me stop here and we call this as the local minima. Okay. So, we will uh, not worry about this at this point in time. I just thought I would uh, tell you about what is local minima and global minima. Uh, gradient descent is usually used to get to the minimum value here. Okay. So, how do we get to that value using the iterative process where we keep changing the value of the weight based on the uh, cost function. Okay. And then uh, we have seen that eta is also your uh, learning parameter which is adjusted to either 0.1, sometimes it could be even 0 0.1, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 depending on uh, your application. Uh, we normally start with the initialization uh, using random values, all the weights are adjusted uh, to have random values and then the weights are adjusted in the direction of steepest uh, descent or in the direction that uh, decreases the cost function. And then uh, we know that uh, how to uh, compute this and we will talk about this when you go into the uh, artificial neural network where we have multiple layers. Okay. And assume that uh, for now that we are going to be using gradient descent algorithm that is going to take us uh, to the 
minimum or uh, let us call it as the uh, minimum of this function. Okay. Uh, again uh, you will see representation of the same thing in different ways. This is a one dimensional representation. Uh, you will also see the quadratic uh, uh, contours. Uh, it is seen from the top. Okay. So, what we have is a side view of this uh, uh, function. This is seen from the top. You will see uh, the iterative process moving in from or sliding into the minima from here. So, it is like this. Okay, and when you see from the top, you would see the uh, contours in this fashion. And then we are coming down from here to here to here to here and that is what is shown here in this fashion. So, it is an iterative process and also you can see that uh, uh, the, the decision function also is moving slowly and steadily closer to the actual one which is provided as plus corresponds to the original data point and that could be obtained by an iterative process starting from this. So, initially you have some random values in this case it is 0. Uh, I think we spoke about that earlier. 